Good morning. I bring you greetings from St. Paul United Methodist Church. We're a reconciling congregation in Omaha. Hello to the people who are with us in person, including the choir making their September return. Thank you very much. Hello. And I also greet the people who are watching on the live stream and people who will find us on our YouTube channel at some point in the near or distant future. We're glad to see all of you. I'm going to look at the announcements that are printed on the inside of your worship flyer. I've made a list of my personal highlights, although, as always, we welcome you to take this home and post it somewhere where you can see it every day to be excited about everything that's happening at your church. But first, we have two new things coming soon. Dinner church and bar church. Here's how it goes. They both have their own new names. You do not have to remember these names, but I celebrate that they have names. Dinner church is called bread and cup. Get it? Bread and cup, it's like communion and like dinner. And Bar Church is called Unorthodox because it is <laughs> unorthodox. Um, and so here's the thing. If you're listening to me now, we hope that you have found a worship service that you enjoy. You are welcome to double or triple or quadruple or hexuple dip worship services. <laughs> Any of that is great. And you're also welcome to stay with what you know and pray for everything else without ceasing. That would be really helpful. Thinking about who you might invite, if you have a friend or relative who says something like this, if I enter a church building, the whole thing will go up in flames, that's when you say, good news. We have an unorthodox service that meets in a bar because it, it, at least it will get their attention. And that starts this week on Tuesday. And we will take good care of those people. So that's, that's what we're thinking. Now, if we show up, and even though we thought it would be 21 to 35-year-olds, and who's there is a wonderful group of baby boomers, good news, we will have started Baby Boomers After Hours Church. That's not a problem. You know, you just keep going with whatever the Spirit gives you. Thinking about dinner church, if you know someone who likes to eat food, who says, I can't handle worshiping in a sanctuary, or who likes the music of John Huff, that might be how you guide them to dinner church. Right? So all of that, if it's just too much to handle, keep going with what you know. If you can tolerate praying for all of us, that would be great. If you have the energy to show up or invite, we would love that as well. Now, after church today, we launch Sunday school. In theory, that's for children and teenagers upstairs above the parlor. If you think of anyone in your life who you might invite to future weeks, invite them. If you are thinking, you know what would be perfect is if we had an adult class 
Or if you're thinking, I think I'd be a better teenage teacher than what they've got, please tell Marta and we will sign you up for that, right? And also you can pray. Now would be a good time to sign up for the women's retreat so that the team knows that you're coming. Information about that's in the bulletin. And finally, we'll give you more details about our next parking lot party, but it is October 1st. Here's what you can start dreaming about. Pumpkins, pets, corn dogs, and live music. We are so glad to see you. We are so glad for all the ways that we are learning together how to receive the Holy Spirit's call in our lives and reach out to our neighborhood. And I welcome you to worship. stand for our call to worship. We come to worship this morning from different places. We come to worship this morning for different reasons. We experience the presence of the Spirit in different ways. We hear Jesus' words with different ears. Oh God, do not be far from us. Deny yourselves. Oh God, do not be far from us. Take up your cross. Oh God, do not be far from us. Follow me. Oh God, we thank you for drawing near to us in this place and in our lives.
Let us affirm our faith together. We believe in a God who is never confined to our imagining, is never in bondage to our beliefs, and never held fast in our dwelling places. Our God is the mystery of divine and human bound together, of power and vulnerability, of crucifixion and resurrection. Our God is the wonder of truth and compassion, of liberation and responsibility, of eternal wisdom and costly grace. We celebrate this God who leaps free of all our boundaries in love stretching out from horizon to horizon and in mercy bending deep into fragile human hearts. Let us offer one another signs of reconciliation and love. We come today as believers in faith who are guided by the strength and knowledge of our Savior and can heal and to set free. We come in the knowledge that knowing that we can come and deposit our prayers, our petitions, and our needs this day at the foot of the cross. And so we gather and we pray for the whole family of our church here at St. Paul. May all your people be built upon, built up in faith and demonstrate in their lives the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. Give courage to those who find it hard to follow. Give us encouragement when we, like St. Peter, find the teachings of your son difficult to take on board. We ask for your blessings on all the activities particularly the new ministries that are beginning during this fall update. Our Sunday school department, an Orthodox bar church, and bread and cup dinner church experience. As we know that without you, all of our efforts would be in vain. God of mercy. Creator God, we pray for your world, particularly those countries that are torn apart in conflict, illness, and hunger. We continue to pray for the people of Afghanistan as they begin to rebuild their lives following the recent events. We ask for your protection and support for all refugees who have had to move to new countries. We pray for the leaders of all nations, that they will strive for justice and peace for all peoples. God of mercy. Amen. Loving God, we pray for our local community. Please show us how we can be best serve, how we can best serve the people who are struggling in any way. We pray for the organizations that are beginning to meet for the very first time since the COVID pandemic began. We pray for children, for teachers, and the administrators as they begin their new school year. God of mercy. Amen. Caring God, we pray for all those who are afflicted by physical, emotional, or mental illness. Help them to keep their eyes fixed on you and give them the courage to face the trials and tribulations that may come. Bring healing and comfort for the people around the world that are struggling and suffering from the short and long-term effects of COVID-19. Speed their recovery and slow the spread of the virus, we pray. 
God of mercy. Amen. Loving God, we pray for those kept fresh in our memory and for those long forgotten, for all who shared our home, our places of work, and our church life, for all who helped to shape our own individual lives. We pray too for the recently departed, especially Marine Corporal Dagan Page, and for those 3,000 individuals whom we remember that were tragically killed on this 20th anniversary of 9-11, asking that they find rest in your heavenly kingdom. God of mercy. As a people of God and a people of confidence, we end this prayer in the very words you taught us so long ago. Will you join me and pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our Psalter lesson this day is found in the back of the hymnal that you find in the pew rack, looking today for page 750. When you find that page, you will see Psalm 19. You will also see this first response. Listen, and we will sing it together. The law of God is just, reviving the soul. The law of God is just, reviving the soul. Our Psalter today is a poetic masterpiece that celebrates God's mighty creation and life-giving law as the basis for a humble and faithful piety. It celebrates both modes of God's revelation through creation and through the written word and describes the fitting response to this twofold gift, its poignant images, the eloquent heavens, the racing sun, the honey-sweet law are especially memorable. Psalm 19. The heavens are declaring the glory of God and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. In them, God has sent a set a tent for the sun, which comes forth like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and runs its course with joy like a strong man. And there is nothing hid from its heat. The law of God is just, reviving the soul. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is true, in the the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, and the of the The law of God is just, reviving the soul. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can understand one's own errors? Clearly, from their faults, 
also keep your servant from the insolent. Let them not have dominion over me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, the law of God is just, reviving the soul. Our lectionary today is from the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to Mark, reading from the 8th chapter and beginning with the 30th verse. Please rise in body or in spirit for the reading of the Gospel. And Jesus sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of life. Thanks be to God.
of you asked me once if I had coffee in the pulpit. It's, it's water. It's just easier to hold on to with a handle. Um, but it made me think about Bar Church, and we're not having Bar Church in this sanctuary. I just thought I should clarify. Um, today's scripture is one that if you've been coming to church for a while, is probably familiar to you. Um, it does come from the Gospel of Mark, and the part that this year is really speaking to me is a part where I think we hear Jesus talking to us about how we find our life through the generous love of our neighbors. He uses two words that are paired together, lose and save, and he does it in a rhetorical form. For all of you rhetorical form nerds, where is Linda Mead? She is my buddy in this. Yes, it is a chiasmus made popular more in our time by JFK. Um, do you remember how he said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country? Right, and those words kind of make a cross, like Jesus. Well, Jesus says, those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life will save it. His words make the shape of a cross, a chiasmus. So um, we hear this contrast between losing and saving. Those who might want to save their life, who might preserve or cling to it for themselves, will surely lose that. While those who are willing to let go or loosen their grip on their reality or their life, for the sake of Jesus and the gospel, not for the sake of a gamble for their own future, but for the sake of Jesus and the gospel, they surely will save or find a new life. This losing and saving, I know I am hearing better as a loosening and finding. Asking the question, how is it that we loosen our lives, or our perception of our lives, our assumptions, so that we might not so much save as discover or find God's call on our lives. How is it that in loosening our assumptions about our neighbors, we might find our life through the generous love of those neighbors? I have two stories. One is a little bit more serious and one is a bit more goofy. You know me, we'll end on the goofy one. A number of my pastor friends have been texting each other in groups leading up to the 20th anniversary of 9-11, asking each other what it is that we remember. And I've been intrigued about how over the course of the weeks, what we have remembered has changed as we have loosened those memories. The first memories that we had were things like where we were when we either saw the images on television or someone told us what was happening. The next memories of who it was that we either needed to share that news with or who we went to to discuss or process or who it was that we comforted or gave comfort. The next group of memories were just the odd little bits of things. Maybe for those of us who live here, the memories of which planes we saw coming or going and at what time. Friends who didn't live where they could see the Offutt airplane traffic have had interesting memories that were very tactile, something that they remember smelling or tasting or touching that day. So as their memories loosened, different senses were engaged. 
but almost all of them were tied to some kind of relationship with somebody else. So they remembered an aroma from something they were cooking, they remember who they were cooking for. If they remember the touch of a quilt or blanket, they remember who it was they were tucking in to comfort some child in their family. I've been interested by that loosening of memory and how with it comes a value of human relationship. I think that these terrific traumas that happen to us, we would never wish to have happen again, would we? And yet in the midst of them, we find some loosening that informs who we are today. I think we as people in the United States might have had a bit of a loosening of who we are as a people. Maybe we weren't everybody's favorite nation. Maybe we did have some rethinking to do about how we are connected to one another, even within the United States. And as our memories shake loose, what we celebrate are the things we learned. People that we don't think of as being specially trained can indeed help one another. Neighbors can indeed support neighbors. People can come forward to share care with one another. I think we are better equipped as people to be in community with one another because we learned how to loosen ourselves from our own homes to be a community to support one another because that was what was needed then and indeed is needed right now. In the midst of revisiting our assumptions about who can help, who we are, what a community is and what the global community can be, I think we've emerged as a people who in that loosening were able to find some saving some learnings about how God is in the work of the world in the midst of terrifying times, how hope can be found even in times that we do not understand and cannot fathom. So for me, as I remember that, I also remember God working for good in the world in the midst of a time where we had to be loosened to find the light to draw us out and forward in faith. Now here's a very specific and goofy story. Are you ready? I think we deserve a goofy story. It's been a long, long 18 months or decades since the plague began. So here it goes. I was a child in the 70s and 80s in Lincoln, Nebraska. That means that I grew up with all things go big red. There's no choice. It's not a matter of being proud or not, it's just a fact. Therefore, I grew up hating Barry Switzer. Barry Switzer, I see you understand, some of you. There are videos to help those of you who don't or who want to understand. My entire childhood was consumed with needing to go, not in person, but in a, a general way to the Orange Bowl. And that way was almost always, it seems like multiple times a year, confounded and threatened by Barry Switzer and the um, Sooners. And when that did not happen, it was some random, random but recurring team from Florida. Once in a while, Oklahoma State as well. So I was a child, so those feelings are very cartoon-like. Uh, even still, uh, because I think that worldview was quite specific and not at all loose. Not at all loose. Um, so, this week, a friend of mine, I misstated it in Piano Side. He's not in Oklahoma City, it makes more sense. He's in Norman, I think. Somewhere in Oklahoma that's very football y. Pastor friend has the audacity to tag me on a post on Facebook saying, Oh, are you coming to Norman for the football game? And I'm thinking, We still play them? I thought we'd been relieved of that. <laughs> I hate change, but that was a good one. Um, 
So I write back for all the world to see, no, I would never go anywhere that reminds me of Barry Switzer. Um, meanwhile, a good church friend who's a church lady writes back something incredibly polite. Uh, she says, oh, I regret I am otherwise occupied that day. I will be unable to attend. I, I can't let it go, so I write back. Um, and you will see soon this is an incorrect memory, but again, as a child, you imprint things. Um, there's all kinds of things living in the closet. There's all kind of false memories of Barry Switzer as well. Uh, so I write back right there. I will never forget the time he told us, you can eat tamales. Now, in my head, this was a reference to a football game that if we, good and light, would have won, we would have gone to the Orange Bowl. But if they won, we would have to go to the Fiesta Bowl. And in my head, he had mocked us, saying, let them eat tamales. Well, after I write this, I think, am I an absolute raving, you know, where is this coming from? So I go to the internet to find proof that this happened. I can't find it anywhere. Like, I, I, I'm using every possible keyword, everything I can possibly find uh, to look for this. So I finally resort to, I don't know, some weird grouping of words. And it turns out that I'm, I'm really not quite right. It was the Sun Bowl that we got sent to. I, I gotta tell you, it's been many years since this happened. I, don't, I didn't even know we still had a Sun Bowl or ever had one, and it was tacos. So apparently at some point, Barry Switzer, and I just wanna make sure this is a, sometimes we pastors tell really particular off-center stories so we don't hear any, hurt anyone's heart with something that's too close to home. I'm doing this on purpose right now. So over here, I'm remembering a tamale fiesta bowl hatred story of Switzer. It's really sun bowls and tacos. Here's the worst part though. There's a video. There's a video of my nemesis and from, from some point, I think, in the 70s until Monday. This happened Monday that I find this video. All this time, I have been using part of my brain holding a grudge against this man. I got to be honest. I mean, who knows what other grudges are there? But this I've been holding a long, long, probably 45 years. Well, here's this video. And I'm still crushed. I'm crushed by this. So some local hokey sportscaster, I say hokey with love, in Lincoln, it's in the wide lapel polyester era. He's got his talk show, and there's these four guys, the vannies there. They're talking to each other about some football game that's coming up, blah, 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 blah. They're talking about Switzer and the taco comment. Darn, if he doesn't crash the show, walk on the stage, with a bag of Taco Bell tacos that he hands to Bob Devaney and everyone hugs him. They're friends. It turns out that they think it's hilarious and they're all friends. Do I have any Husker friends back here? I, if you're my age, you're absolutely alarmed by this, but apparently the adults knew the whole time. The adults this whole time knew they were all friends. They were all friends. They thought each other, they thought that, that Barry was hilarious. They're probably right now at bar church just hanging out together somewhere. <laughs> I'm devastated even now. I imprinted a wrong assumption. I print, I imp now I think the game next week might be horrible. I don't plan to watch it. Someone will tell me later what happens. <laughs> But I'm just saying, we can make these wrong assumptions. All this time I could have been enjoying all the jocularity and hilariousness of this weird relationship. I could have had less loathing of the Fiesta Bowl all this time. Because Lord knows it's not like Nebraska hasn't played there plenty of times instead of the Orange Bowl. Now, here's my question for you. Do you think there's things in your life that you made an assumption about that you imprinted wrong? Maybe as a child, but maybe as an adult <laughs> that are keeping you from being your best self? I've thrown a shoe at a TV in my 20s over this man. <laughs> but you know, sometimes these grudges are f f go farther than that. <laughs> 
I think the invitation of the scripture is to loosen ourselves from this stuff <laughs> and work on embracing each other even if we mistakenly think someone threatened us with a tamale. <laughs> um, you all almost brought me to tears a little bit ago. I'm working on not crying ever because it really hurts my sinuses. Um, but I want you to see how you all have loosened your assumptions of what you are to church. I have clergy friends who are really struggling right now because their congregations, some of their members are being really unhelpful about, to the clergy about wearing masks or not in church. And I'm looking at all of you and you are playing so well with others to make this space one where we don't argue and where a visitor who comes in can feel like you care about them. That's an example of loosening up whatever you feel about masks so that we can worship together and be in a place of peace. And I, I have no way to tell you how appreciative I am of that. And there are people in this room who are so thankful to you for doing that. Uh, for reasons that they're unable to say out loud. And that's an example of loosening, of sharing, of reaching out to neighbors. I have no way of saying how excited I am that you're letting us try new things with Bread and Cup and Unorthodox. We've had nothing but positive. Those of you who aren't positive, I thank you so much for merely praying for us. Thank you for loosening your hearts to allow this church to find the people who didn't think we wanted to find them. That's an example of loosening ourselves so that we might seek and find God in the world. And we do that together even if we're not all physically present. Jesus said, those who want to save their life, those who want to open this world to the power of the Holy Spirit, I read that wrong. I read that wrong. Those who want to save their life, who want to protect their stuff, those people who want to preserve everything that ever was, that will be lost because those who lose their life, that's it, who let go so that the Holy Spirit can work in them and of them and with them for the sake of Jesus, not, not for fame, not for, not for show, not because it's easy. Those people who lose themselves into the work of the Holy Spirit, those people, they will save not just themselves, but the world. That makes me really excited, can you tell? And that's what we do together every day as disciples. And the invitation is to do that as a community. But as you return to your homes to think, what is God calling me to loosen today? Am I called to make a small change so I can be more open to God? Am I called to pray for others, to make a small change, to be open to God? Um, because that is where we find our lives. And that's where we find our life as this church and as one another and as disciples. That loosening, that shaking loose is the Holy Spirit at work. I give thanks for you. I give thanks for that good work. Amen. The invitation is extended for us to join in the ministry of Jesus Christ by giving of ourselves, our time, and our talents. We invite you to give of your time, your talents, and your treasures today.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are a Lord who walks beside your people. So we pray for your people who walk for justice. You are a Lord who raises up those who are bent low. So we pray for those held down by the grinding of life and indifference in the world. You are a Lord who feeds the hungry. So we pray for all who long for bread and the means to provide it. You are a Lord who celebrates the small and the insignificant. So we pray for the children and for those who are never noticed. You are a Lord who says, follow me. So we pray for the courage and faith in your hearts that we may take up the cross and find it leads to life. Amen. Thank you. 
as we go forth. May the words of our mouths be acceptable and true. May the meditations of our hearts be loving and pure. As we leave this place, may the actions of our lives be compassionate and just. May the stirrings of our hearts be guided by God's thoughts and wisdom. Amen. Amen.